Mass Tort News presents LegalCast. Welcome to the front line of breaking news in mass torts and other complex litigation areas. We bring you real-time intel and opinions about litigation dockets that are changing history. Bijan Esfandiari discusses his involvement in the emerging pharmaceutical MDL over Gardasil, an HPV vaccine marketed as safe but has now been linked to severe health conditions. With litigation updates expected any day now, Bijan gives Legal Cast a crash course on what to expect in the courtroom. Good afternoon, everyone. This is Mark York at Legal Cast by Mass Tort News, and today I am here with Bijan Fandiari, senior shareholder at Baum Headland. And uh, the, the subject matter is very timely for today's uh, discussion. It's regarding the Gardasil MDL 3036 JPML hearing that just took place uh, up the road, I imagine, from where you're at a little bit uh, in Seattle, Washington. But uh, today, uh, Bijan, we are going to be discussing the lead up to uh, you know the MDL filing, et cetera. And with that, I'm going to you know, ask uh, Bijan to give us some background on himself, the firm, and Gardasil. There you go, Bijan, it's all yours. All right. Uh, well, good morning, Mark, uh, and uh, thank you for having me. It's an honor. Uh, in terms of, of background, uh, I've, I've been with Baum Headland um, since 2007, so going on 15 years, and in that time period, have focused exclusively on uh, pharmaceutical and medical device litigations, uh, products liability cases. Um, which have been very challenging but rewarding. Uh, a few years back, uh, we heard of the litigation of actually a, a young girl, uh, Jennifer Roby, here in Los Angeles, who had uh, sued Merck. Uh, she was represented by uh, Saul Agilat, uh, where she had suffered some very disabling injuries after being injected with Gardasil to the point that she was pretty much wheelchair bound. Uh, needed a wheelchair for any significant distances and needed essentially 24-7 care from her family in order to uh, basically get through the day. Um, we met with Mr. Agilat and, and Jennifer and, you know, and learned that there were other uh, young girls and boys who had been similarly injured and, you, you know, decided to get involved in the litigation after looking at some of the science and, and some of the case reports. Uh, that showed uh, other kids around the world, frankly, uh, getting these injuries. And, and there was no warnings in the label and, and no discussion of these injuries. Uh, and so, you know, we dove right in and began filing cases. Mr. Agilat brought us on to help litigate the Roby case. And we soon started filing other cases, uh, not only in state court California, but in federal court all over the country. Looking back to, I guess you would call it, you know, corporate bad conduct, clinical trials, et cetera. So maneuvering by Merck, which is fairly normal. But this seems to be like a, a more egregious case uh, where they were manipulating. Or can you go into any of the, the specific facts about how it came about and how it led to today, uh, you know, especially the clinical trials? Sure. Uh, you know, so Gardasil actually came on the heels of Vioxx, which was, I'm, I'm sure you're aware of, the other uh, Merck litigation. And and some uh, critics actually referred, because uh, Gardasil is supposed to treat certain strains, uh, strains of the HPV vaccine, human papilloma vac uh, virus, excuse me. Uh, and they referred to HPV as help pay for Vioxx, uh, because that was what, what the euphemism was as to why Gardasil was brought in. Uh, some of the people that oversaw Vioxx and Merck also oversaw Gardasil. And what we are seeing is basically the same type of playbook that took place vis-a-vis -vis Vioxx is occurring vis-a-vis -vis Gardasil in terms of, uh, you know, the allegations are that Merck structured the clinical trials to favor efficacy when it was really not clear if it was the actual, the body's immune system that was resulting in the virus, uh, HPV virus being cleared or the, uh, or, or the vaccine. And secondly, you know, there were short clinical trials, so they kind of masked any long-term injuries, uh, especially autoimmune and neurological injuries, which takes months, if not sometimes years, to, to uh, fully manifest. So it was essentially the same playbook they used in Vioxx. They brought to bear in, in, in Gardasil. 
And similarly in Vioxx, where anybody who speak, spoke ill of Vioxx would be, you know, attacked by Merck, you know, anybody, any doctors who wrote anything would get, uh, you know, blacklisted and so forth. That came out during the Vioxx litigation. Uh, we see similar things going on now, you know, to the extent that anybody who questions Gardasil uh, is labeled by Merck and its lawyers as anti-vaxxers. When, you know, the, the litigation is simply about one vaccine, you know, that, that is causing harm, the same way that Vioxx was about one drug causing harm. Nobody was, you know, saying you should never have any medications ever. Um, so it's it's unfortunate. Uh, you know, we, we represent you know, young girls that are, and boys that are, you know, some on the verge of going blind as a result of the injuries that they suffered from Gardasil. And, you know, they trusted this vaccine. Uh, their parents trusted it after listening to the commercials and, gave, and allowed it to be administered to their kids. And then now that they suffer injuries, Merck is turning around and calling a, you know, 19-year-old girl who's going blind or who's disabled an anti-vaxxer. And it's, uh, it's disgusting, frankly. Um, so we, uh, you know, the, the clients are really what make the case, um, important to us because, you know, their voices need to be heard and they need to be, uh, compensated for what they've gone through and Merck needs to be held accountable for what it's done. Is that, is the, uh, bad conduct in the clinical trials, is that going to be a, a focus a part of what, as things progress in the litigation, it's going to be pointing directly to, you know, this is fast track. You were really manipulating things in your favor versus the long-term risks. Absolutely. The, both the focus will be on the clinical trials. We actually, in discovery, you know, when Mr. Agilat, for example, had the Roby case, after two years of litigation, Merck had only produced 700 pages of documents. Oh. Uh, so when we got involved, we spent, I must have had at least 13 hearings with the court uh, and, you know, multiple motions to compel and, and discovery conferences. And ultimately that resulted in about uh, well over 20 million pages uh, yeah. being produced. And it's still, you know, they're holding things back. Uh, but what we're tr trying to obtain and have obtained partially is the underlying raw data from the clinical trials. Mm -hmm. So as to allow our experts to go back uh, because, you know, we know how the playbook works. We know, you know, how they, you know, make it difficult for investigators to report adverse events mm -hmm. and, and how coding systems, you know, will downplay adverse events. Somebody, you know, is seriously injured and then the coding system will say they had a headache, uh, yeah. you know, that type of thing. So, um, you know, and, and we are in, in the process of obtaining the full clinical trial raw data. We were going to be bringing motions to compel to get those. Uh, but it is a, you know, time taking process, obviously, with that volume of documents to go through with experts and, and our uh, review team. But yes, clinical trials will be a focus, as will be the uh, post marketing conduct, because, you know, people started getting injured after this hit the um, global market. And, and Merck, uh, it is our allegation, did not do a fair and adequate job of capturing those risks investigating those risks and, and doing the causality assessments that they're obligated to do. This, um, because this really outside of, uh, you know, I follow a lot of the, the pharma, the issues, adverse events, et cetera, outside of what you, you were doing and the, the Roby case before there, there hasn't been a lot of spotlight on the Gardasil vaccine and all the issues that go along with it going back to 2006, seven and eight and everything. So, Going into, you know, the business side of things, you know, the plaintiff pool, I imagine, is probably a little bit more significant. You know, there's probably a lot more injuries out there than anyone is expecting or reviewing. And uh, this hasn't been on the radar, generally speaking, like uh, a lot of the other emerging dockets, even though this has been kind of there in the back burner to a degree. Is that something that you see as viable? Yes, I think, you know, in terms of just when we're going through the uh, uh, vaccine adverse event, kind of VAERS, it's called, it's similar to the mm -hmm. drug adverse event database for the FDA and, and the number of injuries. And, you know, articles have been written that only about 1% of adverse event cases get reported yes. to that system. Mm -hmm. and, and looking at the injuries, we feel there's going to be thousands, if not tens of thousands of injured 
uh, boys and girls, you know, children uh, as a result of Gardasil. The other problem is, is when you're dealing with autoimmune injuries, um, the literature states that it usually takes five to seven years before even a formal diagnosis is made because you're going from specialist to specialist and people are trying to figure out what is wrong with you Mm -hmm. because a lot of times you'll have like a complete system failure at different organs involved. Um, So there's a delay in in diagnosis uh, while, Mm -hmm. you know, the patient is basically uh, going on a downhill uh, spiral. Um, And because Merck has never warned about this injury and the risk, doctors never are able to equate it back to a vaccine that uh, the child may have received, you know, months, if not a a year or so earlier. So we feel, you know, the medical community and the public are not aware of the risks and therefore it's not being reported and it's not being recognized by the medical profession. I think one of the things that litigation does and it has done in other, um, uh, you know, cases, both on the pharma side and the device side is that it brings to light injuries to, you know, doctors who otherwise and, and medical community and regulators that otherwise would not have known of these risks. Um, so, you know, it was the litigation that resulted in Vioxx getting removed from the market. Um, uh, so, yes, we feel definitely as the as the litigation picks up steam, that there is going to be a, a lot more um, uh, client, uh, patients coming through and recognizing that the injury that they're suffering is actually probably linked to uh, the Gardasil they may have received. Are you planning on, uh, I, you know, using an example as Roundup and the right to know, and you had the whole database that basically was public information 101 on Roundup. Are you planning on doing anything like that as far as getting the information out into the public portal, you know, being a thought leader to try to, you know, get, let the doctors know that that's part of something looking back that you might want to start. Is that, the type of thing that you're looking at is doing on a parallel track as well? That absolutely. I mean, that's one thing that uh, my firm, we pride ourselves on is that not only uh, do we litigate cases, but if through the course of litigation, when we receive internal documents that show bad conduct or show deception, both deception of regulators or, you know, deception of, 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 of data that, you know, we will work to get those documents unsealed uh, by the courts so that we can give them into the hands of regulators, scientists, the media, because we feel, you know, uh, litigation should be public and and what occurs in courts, taxpayers are paying for it and and they need to know. Uh, And it should not be done in a cloak of secrecy, especially when you're dealing with, you know, when the data reveals that a manufacturer is actually deceiving the public. Um, So absolutely, we fully intend to do that uh, in, in compliance with any protective order and, and, and uh, rules of applicable to the documents. Okay, looking back to the uh, MDL hearing of last week, which is, you know, most of our target audience are mass tort lawyers. This is what they're, you know, you're comfortable with the results of the hearing and the lead up to it, et cetera. And have you been, has your phone been ringing after the hearing? So we have, you know, when we, uh, prior to the hearing, we actually had a conference uh, through Harris Martin, you know, where other lawyers were, you know, uh, speaking, you know, everyone took turns talking about the litigations that they're involved with. And other lawyers were actually, this was news to them. You know, many people, you know, were even like on the verge of, oh yeah, my doctor recommended that to my daughter, or, you know, I had no idea and I'm gonna take a closer look and so forth. Um, and, and I have lawyers call me and saying, you know, that in, because the injury at issue is one of the primary injuries is called postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which is a um, affects the autonomic nervous system where your blood regulates uh, when you stand up, your autonomic nervous system regulates blood to make sure that enough blood flows to your brain. Otherwise, gravity is going to just pull everything down to the legs. Uh, and uh, girls who have been injured by uh, who have POTS, we call it POTS uh, for short, that system is flawed. So when you stand up, blood doesn't flow uh, enough to the brain and the upper extremities. And over time, you, you have fainting, you have headaches, you have vision issues, hearing issues, balance issues, and, and various organ failures. And, you know, I had a, uh, one of the attorneys said, oh, you know, I know somebody who has that injury and they never knew what the cause was. And, you know, I'm going to go speak with, you know, the, their mom and see uh, if, if, if they've been vaccinated prior to, uh, to it. 
So it, you know, there's certainly people are starting to learn about the litigation. Um, and since we filed the petition, we had additional cases filed. I think we're up to about 50 cases in the federal courts. Uh, and we have, you know, Gardasil needs to go through the vaccine court process before it enters the civil arena. And there's another 100 cases in the vaccine courts. So I envision we will have uh, thousands of cases. Sure. Uh, and there's certainly, and that's one of the reasons we need the MDL and we need the support of other firms because, you know, it's, it's you know, everyone, it's when everyone contributes and works together that you can, you know, uh, bring down Goliath, sure. so to speak. Right. There, uh, and I understand that the uh, defense said, "Oh, these are there. Are, there is no uh, common injury allegation here." They wanted to go down the individual suit road. Is that? Can you go into that at all about how failed of a statement that was? That was actually one of the questions, you know, that the judges raised and, and Merck had put in their papers. And, and and the irony is, is, you know, there's another vaccine MDL. It's the shingles vaccine, Zostavax, that ironically Merck manufactures. And in that case, it was Merck who asked for an MDL to be created. And that is also a case where the vaccine causes various types of autoimmune injuries. Mm -hmm. So you had people with kidney disease, liver disease, uh, eye injuries as a result of the shingles vaccine. And Merck had no problem seeking consolidation and obtaining consolidation of those. Here, actually, the injuries are more focused than even the shingles vaccine. We're dealing with autoimmune injury and primarily autoimmune injury impacting the autonomic nervous system. Majority, I think when we filed the petition out of the, at that time, we had, I think, 34 cases, 33 of them had POTS. Uh, one of them had, had a different type of uh, bleeding injury. So I don't think you know, that argument should win the day, at least if one looks at the facts and uh, precedent. Um, so, and here I think there is not, there, there, there is a common mechanism of action that, you know, warrants uh, consolidation. One thing that's uh, always seems to be uh, uh, recognized as a, a good, a team, your, your co-counsel on this, with Mr. Kennedy, that, you know, goes back to the roundup. And of course, you know, that was extremely viable. And, you know, you basically brought Monsanto down to their knees and it still continues. Uh, stock still hasn't recovered, but that's another topic. But, uh, you know, Kennedy is involved in this. And so it looks like, you know, I'm not saying you're reforming the team because we're probably there, but that seems to be a really uh, a viable partnership there going, you know, in, in matters like this. Do you agree? I, you know, it, it is an honor of my legal career to be able to work with uh, Bobby Kennedy. I, I respect him. I respected him when I was in law school and his, his dad and, and his uncle uh, were heroes of mine uh, before I even uh, had come to America. So to be able to sit at council table, for example, during the Roby hearing with Mr. Kennedy, and I uh, arguing, you know, on behalf of Jennifer Roby, I, 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 it was honestly one of the highlights of my legal career. And to have him as a partner in this litigation and the amount of uh, love he shows to these moms and, and girls who've been injured. Uh, and, you know, the fact that he lends his ear to hear their story and has a platform to relay that story to others uh, I think, you know, not many people in this position are willing to do that. The fact that he does it and then in response, he has to deal with the wrath of Merck and, and being labeled various uh, derogatory names, you know, which is part of Merck's playbook. Uh, and yet he still does it. Um, you know, I'm, I'm in awe of, of everything he does. So it, it, it is, it's, it's, it's an honor to have him on this case, as it was an honor to have him uh, partners in Roundup. In the just the general MDL forecasting, I remember about a year ago, whenever people were like, uh, oh, pharma MDLs, there's just nothing coming. There's nothing on the horizon. You guys, of course, were working very subtly and moving it, moving your, you know, your planning forward, filing your cases, etc. cetera. But um, it seems that this could be, I mean, Looking back a year ago and everyone was wondering, oh, the, you know, the pool isn't there. Now that lo this looks like this could become a very significant docket 
uh, in the whole, you know, the, the drug litigation world. Does that seem viable? I, I absolutely, I, absolutely, I believe so. And especially as as I said, as as more people begin to learn about the injury and about the link between Gardasil, um, you know, there was a little by little, there was a lot of publications coming out uh, about the Gardasil and its link with um, autoimmune injuries. You know, Gardasil entered the market in 2006 and it took some time because autoimmune injury takes some time before it's manifested and before doctors began to see what's going on. Um, and, and, you know, our, right you know articles were published even where researchers independent researchers tried to obtain access to Merck data to look at the clinical trials to see what the risks were and one of the studies showed a nearly twofold statistically significant risk of of uh pots in patients who were given gardasil versus uh the quote unquote placebo so uh the, the data i think as we do the litigation is going to become more uh, you know profound as we get the internal documents and usually, you know, the, these cases, you know, it's, it's a slow moving train at the beginning and then it, it, it picks up steam, sure. uh, you know, as the litigation picks up. So, yeah, I, I envision this to be akin to any other uh, pharmaceutical litigation. You know, it's not going to have the same numbers, perhaps, as Vioxx and so forth, because Vioxx was so profoundly, um, uh, you know, distributed and, and, and given to people. But it will be a significant litigation nonetheless. As far as uh, Merck and suppression of, you know, science and which is pretty, you know, it, it, it's a regular occurrence whenever pharma companies don't want bad press, bad medical, you know, journals, etc. Do you think that they were engaging in somewhat some type of suppression or or changing the public, the public awareness of trying to keep, uh, you know, the non-cooperation with researchers, etc.? Do you think they were involved in this on a regular basis? Yes, yes. I mean, I think they did that. You know, litigation showed that they were doing that vis-a-vis -vis Biox, mm -hmm. and 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 we already you know see evidence of it occurring uh, in, in in Gardasil. You know, the Gardasil is, I believe, about a, a recent, four billion dollar a year mm -hmm. juggernaut for Merck, and so they're going to do everything in their power to protect that brand and 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 and, and protect those sales. Um, and which is unfortunate, you know, I, I think, you know, it's mind boggling to me, for example, that clinical trials are not publicly accessible to all researchers mm -hmm. so that everybody could have a review and come to an independent analysis. And that the fact that we are s s enslaved to Merck's analysis of its own clinical trials is, I think, what leads to. Uh, the risk of corruption and manipulation and concealment. Sure. Do you see this? Uh, um, I mean, there's, I'm, you know, I've been following MDLs for a bit. Uh, other than the Zosta Vax in Pennsylvania, this is, uh, I don't recall any other vaccine being in an MDL. And if there was, I mean, and have the two that are out to have both be come under, under Merck's umbrella does it seem like a good trend to be involved in? Uh, not for Merck, it doesn't, <laughs> no. Uh, and, and you are correct. There's, you know, at least in my the lifetime of my legal career, I don't recall any other uh, vaccine MDLs. Uh, mm -hmm. But, you know, that doesn't mean, uh, you know, I think the f many vaccines, because they have to go through the vaccine court, a lot of us on the, you know, drug and pharma mass tort side kind of left that to the vaccine court lawyers sure. and they not get involved. Uh, but, you know, as, as with any product that is now given and advertised to be given to, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of children, uh, you are going to see injuries. And, and, and when you, you know, peel the curtain, you'll see that Merck knew of those injuries and, and saw those even in the clinical trials. But, you know, what we believe is it cared more about uh, profits than it did safety, uh, which is what Vioxx shows, showed. And we believe that this litigation will show. Kind of switching over to like the worldwide global view, um, the amount of, uh, you know, uh, the push for this vaccine to be used worldwide. I imagine that 
you know, just extrapolating and calculating the number of injuries here. And I imagine it's a lot easier to get a vaccine or any drug from someone like Merck out into the mainstream commerce worldwide than, at, than in the U.S. because, you know, they kind of uh, use it as a, you know, an entry point. But do you see like this, you know, shining the light on what's going on here in the U.S., that that will transition over into like what happened in Roundup? You know, not to use the same comparison, but a lot of people were following that case worldwide. Do you see this as having a parallel track worldwide? Yes. And, and I have to say, you know, from my former experience, many times we would like to think that the FDA should be the leader globally of, of safety and bringing safety news, uh, you know, to the forefront. Uh, but because of, you know, there's such a kind of what we call a regulatory capture where many of the people that are working at the FDA used to work at pharma and it's just, just this revolving door where, you know, while FDA is supposed to be regulating the industry, it views the industry as a customer. And, you know, bends over backwards to try to appease them um, that a lot of times the regulatory activities are coming more from Europe and other countries than they are from the FDA. So one of the first countries actually to ring the alarm was Japan, uh, where Japan, you know, uh, recommended Gardasil to be given to all uh, high school girls you know, entering high school. Uh, and shortly all of a sudden, they saw an uptick of these autoimmune injuries, these POTS injuries. And, uh, in, you know, they started looking into it. And after they realizing that there was a connection, they removed the recommendation of Gardasil. And as soon as they removed the recommendation of Gardasil, the levels of POTS came back down to baseline where we, they were before Gardasil had entered the market. So it showed this kind of uh, challenge, re-challenge, where the, not only the regulatory body, but more primarily the, the researchers said that was evidence of causation. So, you know, I've seen that also in other pharma cases I've handled where you see Europe, you know, kind of finding the risks sooner than the FDA does. Um, and and it is, it's a global problem. You know, it's a global product and, and you know, uh, side effects don't know borders. You know, so they're going to, you know, impact people equally. Okay. So, uh, you know, of course, we were in that seven to 10 day waiting period for the JPML to get something uh, going here. And uh, with that, I mean, it, everyone seems to be pretty confident it's going to become an MDL. Do you have any idea? Were you uh, able to insert like your choices of venues or anything like that? Because, you know, sometimes that has an impact on how things move forward. Certainly. Yeah, I, I feel, you know, in terms of the facts of the case and, and the case law that an MDL should be granted. Now, obviously, uh, things don't always go as I predicted, unfortunately. So but fingers crossed that we will get the MDL. And what we advocated for was the District Court of Arizona. Oh. Uh, first reason was that was the first federal case. Uh, that judge is familiar with the case, has heard some of the arguments that Merck has made, has ruled on also some oh. of the case-specific discovery for the plaintiff. Uh, and Arizona, uh, they don't have any MDLs pending in, in the District of Arizona right now. They handled the IVC Bard yeah. case and yeah. did a nice job of that. So they have the, hopefully they have the resources, we believe, uh, to, to handle the MDL. And, you know, being in California, I, I always like to have an, court that's close to home, you know, so Arizona is not that far away. And it's within the Ninth Circuit, uh, which is a circuit that I'm comfortable with. And, you know, especially as it's a circuit that is very experienced in, in handling pharmaceutical litigations, uh, both from a Daubert perspective and a causation perspective. Uh, so that that was what we advocated for. And, and I'm hoping that's where it ends up. But honestly, we, we will take any any court, you know, uh, that the panel feels uh warrants, you know, overseeing this case, um, you know, as, uh, because I think what we do need is the consolidation just to make this a more streamlined litigation, because otherwise Merck is going to have us, you know, fighting multiple wars at multiple fronts. And, and the only one who wins is Merck. 
Do you see this? Uh, you mentioned the term science and Dauber. Do you think this is going to be a, a heart? This is going to be a battle there that, uh, you know, to prove, you know, that Merck is really going to come out swinging and trying to disprove anything that you're asserting as far as science and causation. And in every pharma and toxic tort case, I mean, the, the Dauber, uh, you know, that that is basically uh, what, what the, the, the target is in terms of overcoming. We feel confident that we will overcome it. Uh, I do, you know, there's still a, a swaths of internal documents from Merck that I want to get access to just so I can make sure that we overcome that hill. Uh, but uh, I, 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 it'll be challenging. You know, every Daubert hearing is 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 kind of a a challenge, and but uh, I'm confident that we should be able to overcome it, especially if we're given access to the full clinical trials and and the full internal documents. Well, with that, I think we can kind of uh, you know start. We can wrap this up. Uh, is there anything that you want to you know comment on whether it's to uh, you know the potential. Uh, the injured uh, families or your co-counsel or anything or potential co-counsel, et cetera, as, you know, as things progress, of course, we have you know, just a short period of time to wait for the uh, MDL to be granted. But uh, in closing, what would you like to offer? You know, in, in closing, I think, um, you know, this litigation started before COVID. And then when COVID hit, uh, Merck definitely shifted the narrative to try to paint the litigation as anti-vaxxers and, and, and try to kind of say Gardasil is good as the COVID vaccine and, you know, no, nobody should be. Even at the MDL hearing, uh, that was part of the theme that they were arguing. Um, and, you know, and, and making disparaging comments against, you know, counsel plaintiffs and then in particular, Mr. Kennedy. Um, and, you know, it's unfortunate. That, that 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 is the path that they chose to go down you know we, we we're litigating this from a science front we feel that the science shows causation we feel that when Merck you know airs these commercials on TV that I'm sure you and others have seen that you know scare mothers into vaccinating their kids because they claim that this is going to cure cancer when in reality the efficacy is questionable uh, and uh, you know these risks are are, are significant disabling and profound and never warned about that I'm hoping through this litigation, you know, which is what I hope I have for all of the litigations we engage in that will bring public awareness so that, that, you know, the choice of whether one accepts this vaccine or a parent decides to vaccinate their kids should only occur after they've been, been given all the benefits and all the risks. And, and Merck has concealed that and, and prevented parents from having that real choice by only telling them about the positive or purported positive and concealing all the negative. Um, and, and that's why the mothers that we represent and the kids are so angry. Uh, and they don't want this to happen to any other family or child. And, you know, it, this is a difficult litigation. It's many long nights and, and you know, uh, uh, on, you know, weekends that are spent just working as opposed to, you know, spending with family and friends. But it's it really what drives me is 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 these mothers and, and, and kids and what they're going through mm -hmm. and that they need every ally uh, in their corner. And I hope other firms get involved. I think it's a just cause uh, and, and, and certainly uh, the injuries warrant not only the MDL, but I, I, I feel when a jury gets to hear the full stories, it's going to have significant uh, verdicts uh, coming down as well. Well, Bijan, I want to say thank you very much. I mean, this is something that we are going to keep on our radar. And uh, specifically, you know, a couple of weeks after the MDL is uh, you know, consolidated and wherever it goes, we should maybe refocus and get you back on and to see where, th where you know, what the, the, the critical path might be, if that's okay with you. Absolutely. Happy to chat, sure. Mark. And thank you for the opportunity to speak with oh, you. Oh, yes. Thank you. And with that, we are going to say goodbye and uh, we'll uh, pick this up soon. Thanks again.